Mandy by Julie Andrews Edwards On the outskirts of a pretty country village called St. Martin's Green, there stands a large white house called St. Martin's Orphanage. It has been there many years. The house has obviously known better days. It has generous tall windows and large high-ceilinged rooms. The grounds, although not extensive, provide enough room at the back for a substantial play area for the children, a kitchen garden, and a modest orchard close to the high stone wall. The front garden is simply an expanse of green lawn and a drive extending from the gate of the road to the main entrance of the house. The matron of the orphanage is Mrs. Hannah Bridie, a greying, elderly woman who has been in charge of St. Martin's ever since the death of her husband twenty years ago. In her care she has, on the average, thirty children. She oversees the laundry, the food, and the cleaning of the home. She maintains discipline and tries to observe and help each child in a personal way. Her day begins at the first light of dawn, and she's never finished until late in the evening. Most people would buckle under the strain, but this plain, good-natured woman seems unflagging in her energies. It is thanks to her devotion that the orphanage has a higher reputation than most other institutions of its kind. Mandy had been there for as long as she could remember. She was a bright, ten-year-old with dark hair that fell boyishly straight and short around her sweet face. The orphanage was her whole world. She had many friends and she was much loved, but basically she preferred to be alone. She was inventive and quick-witted, but above all she was a dreamer. She loved to read. On Saturday mornings she helped out at the local grocer's shop. She was given a small sum of money for her work. Most of her money was spent on her precious books and sometimes on paints, crayons, and paper. Mandy, with the other older children, was sent out each day to attend the local school. Sometimes, after her classes were finished for the day, she wandered slowly home, enjoying the pleasures of the soft countryside around her. She loved the outdoors and everything to do with nature. More often than not, Having first obtained permission from the staff, she would go for a walk by herself. She was rarely lonely at such times. The trees and flowers were very special to her, and she knew the names of most of them by heart. She was able to occupy herself for hours. But it did not follow that Mandy was completely happy. How could she be? She had neither mother nor father. She occasionally experienced very disturbing feelings. Sometimes she felt an ache inside that would not go away. She would cry for no reason at all, and it frightened her. She tried to be brave. I'm having one of my attacks again, she would think, trying hard not to let people see her tears. Every year her longings grew stronger and sometimes she felt as though she must surely break apart with so much going on inside. It was as though she was searching for something, though what or where it was she could not say. The high stone wall at the back of the orphanage held a great fascination for Mandy. It was behind the orchard and stretched for miles. None of the other children seemed to know or care what lay beyond, but Mandy was immensely curious. There's got to be something splendid over there. I just know there's a castle, and I'll bet a handsome prince lives in it. He's probably very lonely. Sometimes she imagined a forest full of animals that could actually speak to her. Her favorite dream was that a unicorn would follow her everywhere and would lie beside her and put his head on her lap. I will call him Snow, she thought. Her desire to see over the wall became an obsession. She broached the subject to her friend Ellie, a maid at the orphanage. Ellie, you know the big wall? Mm-hmm. 
what's on the other side? Oh, I don't rightly know. Just more country, I suppose. Has anyone from here ever seen it? Not that I know. One afternoon after school, Mandy went to the wall and studied it carefully. A large apple tree growing on the other side thrust long pink and white blossomed branches over into the orchard. Mandy went closer, and upon further examination she found that a number of the big yellow stones in the wall protruded just far enough for her to gain a foothold. I might just make it to the top, she thought. With luck I could reach that big branch of the apple tree, and once on it I really could see for miles and miles. She decided to try it that very second. She took a deep breath and began to climb. Carefully testing every stone before she put her weight on it, she pulled herself up inch by inch. Her fingers fumbled and she clung for a moment, breathing hard. Then, with a last careful effort, she pulled herself to the top of the wall and threw her arms around the branch of the apple tree. Now, looking down, the ground seemed a long way away. I didn't realize this was so high, she thought. The orchard was awash with soft, frothy blossoms. She turned and peered excitedly through the apple branches. An incredible vista was spread out before her. Mandy drew in her breath with excitement. She was looking at a whole new world. Hundreds of trees stretching as far as the eye could see. Sunlight filtered through the leaves in bright patches. The woods were open and clear. It looked wonderfully inviting. Mandy saw a small footpath. I've come this far. Now, if I could just get down the other side, she thought. The bark felt smooth and soft beneath her hands as she eased herself to the ground. Now to look for my unicorn. She set off along the path which led into the heart of the woods. Surely I'll find a prince's castle in a little while, she thought. Suddenly she found herself in an open and sunny clearing, a grassy meadow dotted with evergreens. At the far end of the clearing stood a very old and very small cottage. Most of its windows were broken and there was no door. Tiles had slipped off the roof and the little chimney had a ridiculous tilt to it. It was in a very bad state of repair. Gosh, I wonder if someone lives here, thought Mandy. Should I go and see? Oh, perhaps I'd better not. It certainly looks empty. But there might be someone in there. An old tramp or, or a witch. Mandy quietly crept closer, keeping well out of sight behind the trees so that she wouldn't be detected. She could tell that someone must have cultivated a garden once. There was a low fence, broken in several places, with a little gate. Underneath the weeds she could see the remains of a pathway leading to where the front door used to be. She tiptoed up the path, being careful to avoid a large patch of stinging nettles, and peeked through the doorway into a small room. It was empty. Mandy gave a big sigh of relief. The house had no furniture. An old garden rake lay across the floor. Mandy moved to the stairs, treading carefully on the loose boards. Each step she took caused little puffs of dust to rise and swirl in the shafts of sunshine that came through the windows. She climbed up into a tiny bedroom. There was no one about, and no furniture here either. The windows were intact, but extremely dirty. Mandy wiped at the glass with her hand and had a splendid view of the meadow and the woods through which she had just travelled. A little brook was visible, too. It splashed and danced along the base of a hillock. She ran downstairs, gaining courage with every step, and pushed gently at the first of two small doors. It swung open. She was in a tiny kitchen. There was a sink in one corner with a single iron water tap attached to the wall above it. When she turned the tap, drops of rusty liquid dripped out and a spider scuttled from the drain. 
she went back to the main room and tried the second small door. Mandy was totally unprepared for what she saw. A room which was entirely decorated with seashells, lovely shells of every shape and size and all colours of white and pink and iridescent mother-of-pearl lined every wall and the ceiling too. The effect was one of the most beautiful sights Mandy had ever seen. The afternoon light shone softly through a big bay window at the end of the room. Cobwebs hung in silent strands. A pair of old curtains made of soft material moved gently in the breeze coming through the open door. The woodwork and the window and the door were painted gold, and the floor was tile or marble. The large fireplace seemed to be of marble, too. How this extraordinary room came to be in this small cottage, so many miles from anywhere, Mandy couldn't begin to imagine. She moved round, touching the shelves and the curtains and the fireplace. Everything was coated with dust. She wandered outside to the clearing and sat down on the grass, drawing her knees up under her chin. She stared at the little house and garden for a very long time. Who could have lived here, she wondered. It can't have been a family, for there's just the one bedroom, and the whole house is hardly big enough. Maybe somebody lived here alone. But what kind of person would do that? And did he make the shell room? The discovery of this wonderful place was more exciting than finding a castle. What if, said Mandy to herself, what if I pretended this cottage were mine? I could sort of adopt it. Well, who would know? Who would care? Nobody lives here, I'm sure of that now. Somebody needs to take care of it. Oh, and I could take care of it. She sprang to her feet. I could. This place could really be mine, a house of my very own. I could pull all the weeds out of the garden and plant flowers and mend the fence and make the path tidy. I could sweep and dust inside and clean the shell room and wash the curtains and the windows. Oh, little house, I could take such good care of you. Suddenly she realized the sky was darkening. Oh, heavens, I must get back. Matron will be worried about me. Running across the meadow, Mandy paused briefly for a final look at her newfound delight. I'll be back tomorrow, Mandy whispered to it, and she sped through the woods. Mandy shared a bedroom with one other girl. Her name was Sue. She and Mandy were close friends. The girls were almost the same age, Generally, they got on very well. They even borrowed clothing from each other and behaved much like sisters. It was an attic bedroom, and Mandy loved it. She enjoyed being high up in the house, away from all the other children. There was a small skylight in the roof just over her bed. Many nights she lay awake thinking and gazing at the distant stars in the sky above her. She found them very comforting. But on the evening of the day she discovered the cottage, she was happily preoccupied with thoughts of the pretty little house. As Mandy and Sue were preparing for bed, Ellie, the maid, appeared around the door. Mandy, I found out something for you. You know you asked what was on the other side of the big wall. Mandy's heart skipped a beat. Yes? Well, matron says it's a big estate in there. A really big one, only nobody lives there any more. Oh, uh, um, thank you, Ellie. What a marvellous piece of luck. If nobody lived there, then she wouldn't be bothering a soul if she visited the cottage. It really could be hers. As she snuggled into bed and turned out the light, Mandy felt wonderfully content. Sue, she whispered into the darkness. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, nothing. Good night. She decided that she would say nothing about it just yet. She lay on her back, 
arms behind her head, staring at the night sky winking above her. It was midnight before she fell asleep. The next day was bright and sunny. Mandy could hardly wait for school to be over. It was Friday and all the weekend was before her. After school, she ran into the garden and began looking for old Jake, the handyman and gardener. She found him in the potting shed. He was an old man. He wore exactly the same clothes day in and day out. Black, shiny trousers, a collarless shirt with the sleeves rolled up to the elbow, and a dark blue striped waistcoat. He brought his lunch to the orphanage in a little tin box. His lunchtime drink was always two bottles of beer, and he would snooze for a while in the early afternoon, propped up against the potting shed among the rakes and the spades and brooms and buckets and pots of every shape and size. He knew just about all there was to know about nature. It was his religion. He spent most of his life outdoors, rain or shine. He was just finishing his lunch when Mandy found him. Now, Mandy, don't you come bothering me. I'm going to take my snooze in a while. Oh, Jake, I won't stay long. I, I, I just wanted to ask you a few questions. Well? Is it very difficult to weed a garden? asked Mandy. Do I have to know anything special? Bless my soul! Jake looked surprised. Whose garden are you going to weed? Nobody's. But is it very difficult? Well, it depends on your soil. Jake took a long drink from his beer and wiped his lips with the back of his hand. You see, if it's good and rich and soft, then really most of your weeding can be done by just pulling at the roots, very gently, mind you, until they ease out. And then you can shake them off and throw them away. But if the earth is packed and hard, then you need a small fork or a trowel and dig it in under the weeds, lift them up very gently and shake the earth loose before pulling the plant out. Anyone can do it, he added. I see, said Mandy. Do you have a small fork I could borrow? Thought you weren't going to be doing any of that, said Jake, squinting up at Mandy in a teasing way. I sort of am. Mandy didn't want to tell Jake. It's, uh, it's a project. Well, I can't let you take my things, Jake began. Oh, I'll return it by tonight, Mandy broke in. I promise, Jake. Just try me this once. By the time you get here tomorrow, it'll be back in the shed. Jake wanted his afternoon sleep, and Mandy was in a persistent mood. All right, Mandy, but you're on your honor now. He slowly got up and found her a small fork. It was old and had a smooth, worn handle. Oh, Jake, thank you, Mandy beamed with delight. You just bring it back. He seemed rather pleased with himself. Now, since you're borrowing that, what about a rake to smooth your garden over when the weeds are out, he added. Mandy could have hugged him. It was a glorious afternoon. Since the weather was so fine, she decided to attend to the garden first. Her garden. Kneeling down, she pulled at the long weeds. They came out of the ground very easily. She discovered pale grey flagstones beneath the weeds. It was a big improvement the minute the path was cleared. By late afternoon, Mandy had cleared one whole side of the garden. Near the fence, she discovered quite a large clump of nasturtiums. They would soon be glorious colours of red, orange, yellow and gold. Mandy wiped her brow. She was hot and thirsty. She decided to rest for a moment. Now that the garden was partially cleared, it was easier to guess at its original shape and form. There must once have been a tiny lawn and flower beds under the windows and along the fence. There was a box hedge running around the back of the house, and there were privet hedges too. They would need trimming, and the grass would need cutting. She would have to be nice to Jake, and perhaps he would lend her some more tools, and some twine to tie back the rose tree, and maybe some gloves to protect her from the stinging nettles. She was feeling pleased with herself. 
this is all too wonderful. I could stay here forever. She thought of the shopping she should do. She had pocket money saved, and she received a little every Saturday for her work in the grocer's shop. So tomorrow she'd have enough money to make a start on flowers and things. Mandy got up and wandered indoors. In the shell room there was a little trivet held by a bracket that swung over the fireplace. It must have been used for cooking. So she wouldn't need a stove. Now, if only the fireplace would work. She would collect some wood later and try it. She decided to add pencil and paper to her list so that she could write down all the things to do and not forget them. It was getting late and time to leave for this day. She stood at her front door, looking down the newly weeded garden path. The freshly turned earth smelled wonderful. She wandered slowly to the little stream and bathed her face and hands in the clear water. It was pretty and shaded there with green ferns growing on the banks. Time to go. Gathering up Jake's tools, she headed towards the meadow and home, pausing just long enough to adjust the little white gate. Pulling it straight and setting it up neatly alongside the fence, she noted with pride that the little garden was already beginning to have a trim, cared-for look. On Saturday morning, Mandy emptied her money box. Sue wanted to know what she was going to do. Oh, I'm going to buy a few things. Can I come with you? Well, Mandy didn't know what to say. I'll be shopping right after work. It would be difficult for us to meet. Besides, I, I don't quite know what I'll buy. Sue looked hurt. Tell you what, Mandy said. If I do buy something, I'll show it to you later. Mandy worked hard in the shop all morning. She was there from nine until one o'clock every Saturday, and she always enjoyed herself. Mr. and Mrs. Jennings, who owned the shop, were very good to her. She was too young to serve at the counter and to handle the money, but she did a lot of fetching and carrying. She unpacked the new goods and stored them on the shelves and made herself generally useful. Sometimes in the middle of the morning, she was given a cup of tea and a biscuit. She was usually so busy that the time passed quickly. But today she was particularly anxious for her work to be finished. She looked at some of the items on the shelves. Soups, chocolate drinks, tinned milk, biscuits. Wouldn't it be wonderful if she had enough money to buy them all for her cottage? She decided that she would see how much she had left over after she had purchased her seeds, and then perhaps she would splurge a little. At one o'clock, she raced out of the shop and down the street to the garden supply shop. Mr. Simple, dear Mr. Simple, I need to buy some things, some seeds and things for a garden, and, and I wondered if you could possibly help me choose some. I, I have my money. He smiled at her. What sort of things do you need, Mandy? Oh, uh, gosh, flowers mostly. You know, packages of seeds that I can grow. Oh, what are these? They're pansies ready for planting out. How much are they? About fourpence or fivepence a plant. Fivepence a plant? A single plant? But I'll need so many. Oh, dear, what shall I do? Mr. Simple put his hand on her shoulder. Now, it's not so bad. You don't just have to buy pansies, you know. Come and see what else I have. Here, for instance, these are marigold seedlings. And these are what you would call snapdragons. But they're really named antirrhinums. Now, they're not expensive. And these salvias would be lovely for your garden. Mandy brightened. Could you tell me how to plant them? Yes, but first things first... Do you have things like a spade and a trowel and a fork? Oh, I think Jake would lend me most of those things. That's good. Would he lend you a watering can? Mandy thought about it. I don't think he'd let me have it for that long. I'd need to water almost every day, wouldn't I? Mr. Simple nodded. Now, let's see. Here's what I suggest, and you tell me if you like the idea. First of all, you should have some of these geraniums. He got an empty flat box and put a few geranium plants in it, and marigolds would be a nice splash of colour. 
he added them to the box, and some of these salvias. As he was talking, he was packing more and more plants into the box, and I think maybe just a few nice big pansies would finish a garden off a real treat. Planting these out will be easy, Mandy. Just make a hole in the ground with your finger or a stick, place the seedling in gently, and then make the earth around it firm. Put the plants a few inches apart, then take this little watering can, and he took down a small plastic watering can from the shelf. Water your flowers after planting, and they'll come up strong and healthy. Mandy was thrilled. Here, she said, putting all her money on the counter. Well, now, the plants are a gift from me. The watering can doesn't cost very much. Mr. Simple picked up a few coins from the counter. You keep the rest of the money. He rang up the amount. Is that all right? Oh, Mr. Simple, that's just marvellous, she beamed. Oh, one more thing. How much do gardening gloves cost? They're expensive. Why don't you ask Jake if he has an old pair he doesn't need any more? I will, said Mandy. Thank you very much. Let me know how they all turn out, Mr. Simple said. Mandy hid her purchases in the orchard. The orphanage was at lunch. She was too late to eat in the dining room, so she went to the kitchen and she ate a sandwich and watched Alice, the cook, washing up the piles of dishes. Alice, I need a broom. Oh, you do, do you? Since when did you decide to visit your housewife? I'd like some dusters, too. Now, what are you up to, Mandy? Oh, just a game. Ellie might have a broom. I can give you some muslin. Super, Mandy smiled. She ran into the garden looking for Jake. Hello, Mandy. You brought the rake back. I'm very pleased. I was wondering, Jake, could I please borrow the fork again? Just today. I, I didn't quite finish yesterday. How's the project coming along? Fine, Mandy smiled at him. But, Jake, I need a few extra things. Oh, like what? Well, I, I need twine, and I really need some gloves so that the stinging nettles don't get my hands. Jake looked at her thoughtfully. This seems a very big thing you're doing. What is it, Mandy? Where is it? We don't have a stinging nettle on the property. You'd better take care, my girl. Come on, I'll find you some twine and some gloves. Let me see now. Try these on. For what you need them for, they'll do just fine. Here's your fork and the twine. Now off you go. Be sure to bring the fork back by tonight. Mandy knew that she must get her plants bedded out by the end of the day or they would suffer. It was with mixed feelings of anticipation and pride that she laid out her seedlings, geraniums, salvias, marigolds. She put the pansies in front and made many trips to the little stream to fill her watering can. When she had finished, she stood back to admire the total effect. For all her hard work and careful spacing, the flower beds still looked bare. The plants were bedraggled and skimpy. She hoped they would brighten up by tomorrow. She put on Jake's big gardening gloves and pulled out the stingy nettles in the pathway. Now the little paved area really looked neat and clean. She tied back the rose tree over the door. Every small thing she did made the garden look just that little bit better. Mandy knew that she would have to return Jake's fork that evening. If she could just clear the remaining flower beds by tonight, she wouldn't need the fork any more. Well, not for a while, anyway. The sun was setting as she finished. She was so weary that it was all she could do to climb over the wall back to the orphanage. At dinner she ate very little, and afterwards she headed straight for her room. Sue was quiet as both girls prepared for bed. Suddenly she said, I looked for you today, but I couldn't find you. Mandy was brushing her teeth and was glad that she could use that as an excuse not to talk. Mm-hmm, she mumbled. I wanted to know if you bought anything today. I thought you might be by the big wall where you usually go, so I went there to look for you. Mandy felt a pain inside. 
She hated fibbing to anybody. No, I went for a walk this afternoon. Did you buy anything? Mandy decided on a half-truth. I bought some flowers for Mr. Simple. She saw the surprised look on Sue's face. I just felt like it. But I gave them to Mrs. Rose. You know, the old lady who lives in the cottage just before the shops? Sue accepted this explanation. Both girls climbed into bed and turned out the lights. They lay in the darkness, listening to the sounds of bedtime all over the big house. Slamming doors, children arguing or playing. The voices of the adults firm and strong, establishing order. Then quiet. Sue spoke in a soft voice. Mandy, shall we go to the old quarry tomorrow and play? It's Sunday, and it would be fun. She got no reply. Mandy had fallen fast asleep. The following day was Sunday. Mandy felt free at last and exhilarated. After church, a whole day to herself, and her cottage was waiting. The day smelled fresh and clean. The grass was wet underfoot as she crossed the clearing. A family of rabbits scuttled away into the bank by the stream. Her plants had taken hold well. They looked stronger. I suppose I'll have to wait a few weeks until they all come into bloom, thought Mandy. I do hope they'll be all right. She went indoors to the shell room and gazed at it for a long time. It was such a beautiful room, a peaceful room. Mandy lovingly touched the pretty shells. They were very dusty. Ellie had been cooperative when Mandy tackled her about the broom. Of course you can borrow it, she had said. Just put it back when you're done. Mandy swept the shell room out thoroughly. She lifted the brush and pulled down all the cobwebs and went over the window frames. She brushed the shells as best she could. She brushed through into the main room, up the staircase and down again, and into the kitchen. She was filthy by the time she had finished, but very well pleased with herself. It was getting dark and raining. Mandy was amazed how the time had flown. She decided to wait for the rain to ease off a little, so she stood at the window looking out at the dripping black trees. It was nice to be snug and cosy inside with a roof over her head. A little sparrow was trying to take a bath in a puddle. Mandy watched with delight as the tiny creature fluffed himself out and hunched himself down with much ruffling and shaking of his feathers. He's like a small engine when he gets going, she marveled. I shall bring him some bread tomorrow after school so that I can feed him. Maybe I'll even build a bird bath one day. The following week was a busy one. On Monday, immediately after school, Mandy went to the shops, and with some of the money she had left, she purchased a small dustpan and brush, a scrubbing brush, a box of matches, and some scouring powder. She delightedly stored them in the pantry at the cottage. She wiped all the windows and scrubbed out her sink and her washing bowl. The curtains came down in the shell room and she folded them away. She tried to trim the edges of the pocket handkerchief lawn with a kitchen knife and did a fairly good job of it. She even pulled up great handfuls of the longer grass and got it looking a little shorter, though it really did need a good clipping. School occupied nearly all of the day, and there was homework to do in the evenings. Mandy found it hard to concentrate on either. Every evening at the dinner table, she hid away a spoon or a fork, and even managed a cup and a plate one night. They were all duly taken and stored in the cottage. Mandy collected firewood every chance that she had. Toward the end of the week, she put a few twigs into the fireplace and lit them. It was a disaster. Clouds of smoke filled the room, covering the newly cleaned shells and windows with a fine layer of dust. Mandy coughed and spluttered. Getting on her hands and knees, she peered up the chimney. 
she was instantly doused with a liberal amount of soot. Oh, oh gosh! Mandy brushed her clothes in disgust. Matron's going to be furious! She was determined to find out why the chimney smoked so badly. There was no flue of any kind, so obviously the trouble came from another source. Mandy went outside. One side of the cottage roof sloped down to the hill by the stream. It was an easy matter to climb the hill and make a small jump onto the roof. She immediately saw the cause of her smoking fireplace. It was a bird's nest, perfectly formed and completely blocking the top of the chimney. It seemed like an old nest and Mandy was glad. She wouldn't have had the heart to remove it if there were eggs in it. She lifted up the mass of twigs and straw and looked down into the chimney to make sure there was no other obstruction. There was none, and so now Mandy had a fireplace that finally worked and a room so covered with smoke that it needed cleaning all over again. But it didn't matter. It was part of the fun of putting a house in order. That night it was a surprise, therefore, when Sue turned to her at bedtime and said in a shocked voice, Pooh, Mandy, you smell like you've been in a bonfire. Mandy thought wildly for a moment. It was a bonfire, she said. I was helping Jake today. Well, you certainly smell, was all Sue said in reply. Mandy suddenly saw the funny side of the situation. Long after the lights were out, she lay in bed, giggling helplessly, stuffing the pillow into her mouth for fear she would give herself away. At the end of the week, Matron Bridie sent for Mandy to come to her study. Matron wasted no words. Mandy, I gather that you've been spending a great deal of time away from the orphanage. I'm told that you have a project that you're working on. Would you care to tell me about it? The palms of Mandy's hands were wet, and she began to tremble. Who could have told Matron? You must understand that it's very worrying to have you going off for hours at a time, Matron was saying. The orphanage is responsible for you, and anything could happen when you're away from us like that. Yes, ma'am, Mandy whispered. Would you like to tell me about it? Could I help in some way? Mandy heard herself saying, Well, I, I did have a project going, but I've given it up now. Oh? Matron seemed surprised. Yes, I, I found a spot, and I, I thought it would be fun to try to make it into a sort of place of my own. You know, a little garden and things. But it was too much, so I stopped. I see. Matron looked somewhat puzzled. Well, please know that I don't like your going out alone. I'd rather you didn't. I always told Ellie when I'd be back. Yes, I know, Mandy. You're a very sensible girl, and I trust you completely. I think you were wise to stop your project, said Matron thoughtfully. But I'm a little sorry, too. You see, I do understand you wanting to make a place that you could call your own. You must long for it very much sometimes. She smiled kindly. Mandy suddenly realized that she was about to cry, and she swallowed hard. Oh, she said in a small voice, well, it, it, it doesn't matter. I was wondering, continued Matron, if you would like me to ask Jake to put aside a small plot in the garden that you could work on. It could be your special place. It might be fun. Mandy forced her eyes to stay open wide. No, thank you, ma'am. I've sort of lost interest now. Mandy went out of the room slowly. Her eyes were brimming with tears. Once outside, Mandy leaned against the wall and let the tears flow. She couldn't understand why she was crying. Perhaps she hadn't realized how much the little cottage meant to her. The thought of having to give it up was unbearable. She would have to be terribly careful from now on. She was sure that Matron was only half convinced that she had told the truth. Mandy felt so bad about lying that she ached inside. 